it's all true about the South Seas, wrote the poet Rupert Brooke on his first voyage there at the beginning of this century. There it is, there it wonderfully is, heaven on earth, the ideal life, little work, dancing, singing and eating, naked people of incredible loveliness, perfect manners and immense kindliness, a divine tropic climate and intoxicating beauty of sea. The South Seas have long provided the West with an ideal of paradise on Earth. It was in the South Seas that Gauguin painted paradise and created dreams for many of us. Dreams in which men and women live sensual but uncomplicated lives. Islands where fantasies could endure. The philosopher Rousseau and writers like Conrad and Robert Louis Stevenson turned these dreams into an enduring Western myth. The miseries of cold Northern Europe must have seemed a long way away. The Garden of Eden had shifted to the South Seas. Somewhere there had to be paradise. Once it had been Greece, now it was Polynesia. In some ways, interestingly enough, the myth of the South Seas couldn't be more wrong. The myth that we have of the South Seas is of a place where there are virtually no social constraints, where we do what we want, impulsiveness. Somewhere in the world, there simply had to be a society where human beings would thrive without constraint, without rules. Why Polynesia has been focused on by most writers as a kind of paradise is partly because they fit, in fact, our vision in some way of the most noble representation of ourselves. Polynesians are, to us, attractive people who live in a very physically attractive place. So there was just enough truth to all this romanticism, visually, physically, to make them particularly useful for this image. Robert Flaherty, the early documentary filmmaker, was another of the South Sea's mythmakers. His moving pictures brought Gauguin's paradise to life. The noble savage was never so noble, nor so beautiful, nor so carefree. Nature was generous, food abundant, ugliness unseen. Life was a dream. Flaherty also showed how the Samoans had developed agonizingly painful rituals of tattooing, tests of endurance by which young men could prove their manhood, there being few other challenges in paradise. There was time for music and dance and gentle love under the palm trees. The young grew up without inhibitions. Somewhere here, there had to be a lesson for the overstressed Western world of the 20s, where coming of age was so often seen as a time of tension and conflict. Then along came the anthropologists to add their seal of approval to the myth of the South Seas. Among the first, Margaret Mead seized on Samoa as a model for social change in the West. I was trying to write a book that would be intelligible to the people that might use it. And those were principally teachers, social workers, psychologists. So I wrote it in English. And the result of writing it in English was everybody could read it. And it hit just a moment in history when people were very much interested in the South Seas, very much interested in relaxing many of the taboos that existed in our society, when people were just beginning to read Freud and beginning to try to understand the relationships between the biologically given, and the way the society was organized. 
Margaret Mead studied the patterns of Samoan love life for only six months. The message of her first book, which brought her worldwide fame, was that the tensions of growing up in the West were caused by parental and social pressures. In Samoa, she thought she had discovered a lifestyle which could provide a model for what was later to become our permissive society. Today, critics claim her understanding of Samoa was imperfect, that her research was based on the questioning of only a few young girls, and young Samoans, like youngsters everywhere, love to tell romantic tales. They no doubt helped Margaret Mead to hear what she wanted to hear. They were allowed to pick their lovers fairly freely, or if they didn't want lovers, they could live in the house of the missionary and be protected from them until they felt a little older. Uh, so that most of the things that are hard on adolescents in modern society, all sorts of conflicts about sex and marriage, uh, ignorance about life, and the Samoans' children had peeked through the uh, blinds of houses and seen birth, and they'd watched lovers, and they knew what was going on in the world, and they'd seen death often too. These things that made it hard for adolescents here weren't there. So I was able to come back and say that adolescence is not necessarily the kind of time that we've made it in Europe and America, that the kind of stress that we put on young people induces the kind of sturm and drang, the storm and stress that exists, but it isn't necessary. Today there are two Samoas. The islands of Western Samoa form an independent state. They retain close ties with New Zealand and have the more traditional way of life. American Samoa is a territory of the United States. The islands are no longer uncontaminated by the outside world. If this is still paradise, one must admit that it sometimes looks and sounds like somewhere else. It's all too easy to be misled. Despite the American style, these young people are very Samoan. Samoa High School Band plays rock. And today, young Samoans, like youngsters elsewhere, are familiar with violence. And they have an astonishingly high rate of suicide. Plenty of storm and stress, in fact. Were they imported with the football and the saxophone? Or were they there all the time, unobserved by the foreign seekers after paradise? On a beach, a Samoan television unit is recording scenes from a new play, a play written and performed by high school students. What concerns these young Samoans are not the platitudes of paradise, but the realities of suicide, family honor, and rape. Would one of you mind uh, informing the rest of us what's going on? Really? <laughs> Won't you try asking her? That bastard raped Janine. Ha, 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 funny. You did what? Fly your way out of it now. Judas. Judas, is this true? Are you crazy? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Is it true? You heard me. No! Hey. Come on, man. let's go. I'll get you later, man. Yeah, you watch your mouth before yeah. I come over there. Oh my God, this can't be true. He's my brother. He just raped your best friend. No, no, he didn't. Look, it's 
sooner you're faced with the better. No. No, 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 So there is rape in paradise, and family honor requires that rape has to be avenged by a killing. For these young actors, the melodrama reflects the tensions which are part of their real-life experience. What kind of a man would I be just to let this kind of thing go? What kind of a man would you be if you did it? Is that it? You have to feed your macho ego? Why? To make you a hero? To make sure you have at least one murder under your belt before you turn 21? Or is it to make you a man? You know, I think our ideas of manhood are very different. Look, I'm doing this so that you and Janine and other girls can walk on the streets safely, right? Yeah, walk around with the like of you? Listen, I'm gonna ask you this one more time. If you love me, please, please, don't do this. The style of the drama Sorry. imitates American soap opera, but the problems it deals with are a very real part of Samoan life. Love is far from free, and a sister's virtue is a killing matter. These young actors, in spite of the American veneer, come from traditional homes where sex is not a casual matter. Families are very watchful of their daughter's virginity. When rape happens, brothers defend their sister's honor as their own. Stop, stop! In the play, the girl's desperation over the fight between her lover and her brother brings a tragic but not unfamiliar end to the story. Vito, I have to talk to you, to both of you. I don't know how to say this, it's Sophie. What about her? She's dead. What? what? She killed herself. She overdosed. They found her about an hour ago. Please tell me it's not true. Tell me it's not true. Do I have to spell it for you? Sophie is dead. She committed suicide. No. 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 No, man, no. Please. No, no, not... At Samoa High School, there is a matter-of-fact acceptance of the high degree of violence in the home. It's a subject for frank discussion in the classroom. How do you feel about corporal punishment at home? First of all, tell me, is there corporal punishment in your homes? Yes. yes. When would you be beaten up by your parents? What sort of offense? For example, like, if your dad asked you to go do something for him, like, Go and buy him a cigarette, and you won't do that of uh, what your dad says, and he's going to beat you up. And he's not going to beat you up for getting mad. It says in the Bible, a loving parent beats his kid up for his, for his own good to listen and to respect his parents. If your parents ordered you not to smoke, not to drink, um, not to take drugs, and you must do it, but if you do it, then they, you know, then they hate you because of that. And that is, you know, that is right. What's you know, right? Beating up you because of doing the bad things. That okay. is where you learn. Do you all agree with that? That your parents should, it, it's okay that your parents beat you up when you want? Yes. What most of them are saying that the kids can benefit from beating by the, um, by the parents. Well, I'm against that because some parents are really not, careful with their um, beatings, like, you know, they heavily beat them and they use objects like um, pipes and all that, hoses to beat them up. And that can really drive a kid away from, from their family. It can cause uh, some of the kids to commit suicide or they can be runaways when the, when the parents beat them up. That's what I think. He mentioned something uh, uh, a while ago about that um, the parents they could abuse us, but not that much. But I think that abuse should not occur in any places or even in the homes. Because um, abuse, you know, is just like damaging our, our, our body, you know. If they abuse us, so that means we, it's not the, we have no use of living in this world if they abuse us. Is the anger building up to a point where you may go out and kill yourself? Yes. A lot of times when I get beaten, they tell you everything that, that I think that they shouldn't say. And most of the time when I'm alone, I feel as if I want to commit suicide. It's because of they, give, they, um, they give you too much pressure. And um, for me, when I get beaten up, I just feel like I want to commit suicide. 
Suicide and violence are not imported. Both have long been part of Samoan life. The root of the problem can be found even in the most remote villages, well away from Western influence. Meetings have been organized by the local YMCA to try to get people to talk about conflicts in traditional life, conflicts which the YMCA allege have given Samoa the highest rate of suicide in the world. A new image emerges, that of a tightly disciplined society, and one with a profound sense of personal honor. This girl killed herself. Her brother explains why. My sister died because she had a strong will. She was in love with a relative, a distant cousin. Our father told her she could not marry him, and he scolded her very strongly. She was very upset. That night she took poison, and the next morning we found her behind the kitchen. If our father had not scolded her, she could have married the man, and that would have brought disgrace to our family. The romantic settings and the charms of the South Seas can conceal the inescapable pressures of family obligations on Samoa. Images from great paintings, fantasies from a thousand travel brochures. It seems too casual, too relaxed for there to be a formal power structure underlying it all. But there is, even in paradise. The authority within the apparently casual order comes from the Matai, the village chiefs, Part elected, part hereditary. The strict maintenance of the Fa'a Samoa, the Samoan way of life, is in their hands. From a practical point of view, the Matai is responsible for giving orders, for organizing village life, for ensuring that the pe people under him obey laws, uh, are well behaved, etc when there's, uh, at the symbolic level, the chief is responsible really for articulating the most noble and dignified vision of what life could be. I remember when I was in the past, I was in the past, and 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 I was in the past. To receive a title is the goal of all Samoans. They can then participate in kava ceremonies, rituals which are the traditional focus of all life and the theater of all Samoan power. <laughs> The Kava ceremony is a very delicate way of fine-tuning the decision-making apparatus for a meeting. What's going on in the Kava ceremony is a public recognition in a ritual way of the rank, the relative dignity of all the parties that are present. 
And by accepting a cup of kava in a particular order for this meeting, you are accepting a certain weighting of voices. What you're doing is publicly acknowledging that the most important opinion will come from the first and last recipients of a cup of kava. What then happens is after all this fine tuning has gone on and everybody's acknowledged the nobility of everybody present, very often the substantive matters get handled very, very quickly because the decision-making apparatus has been agreed upon. So it is a finely tuned political system, but its ritual offers little part to the young and the untitled. Only one young girl, the Taupo, or ceremonial village virgin, has a role here. She mixes the kava, a mildly intoxicating drink, which is at the center of the ceremony. The only untitled people inside the kava ceremony itself are normally supposed to be the young man who serves the kava. And then there's the Taupo, who herself is titled, technically. She has a maiden's title, a Taupo title. The rest of the young people sit outside the house. The carver ceremony defines not only a man's rank, but all of his social relationships. Here, a man's participation in the group is more important than a display of individuality. It seems to me that for Samoans, the social part of themselves, the part of themselves that connects themselves to their parents, their chiefs, brothers and sisters, their social obligations are the primary definer of who they are. Um, there is no Samoan term in, in, in the Samoan language for personality, for instance. There is no way to say that. There are only words that refer to sides or parts of people, which are I'm a son of my father, I'm a young, untitled man, I'm a brother to a sister. So that for Samoans, these social obligations, these bonds or relationships are the primary definers of who they are. So what happens to all this need for selfhood? It goes underground. Every Samoan village has a group called the Aumanga. It's translated as the Young Men's Organization. This group are really the group of young men in a village who serve the chiefs, who help the chiefs, and thereby gain future access to power themselves through service. And these young men serve the chiefs and in doing so demonstrate their strength and their vitality by ritualized acts of macho, we would call it, of strength. You'll hear a lot of yelping as they do it, a lot of war cries, always demonstrating the way in which this strength and energy is channeled into the service of the chiefs. For young people prepared to wait their turn, the system offers support and a great warmth of family feeling, with the promise of rewards to come. <laughs> For the man who ultimately receives a title, the waiting can be worthwhile. As you get older and get involved in the political system, the Samoan political system, the adrenaline starts to pump as you become more influential and you begin to become a matai or the wife of a matai or become higher up in your uh, church group. The politics and the excitement of interacting with other people of the same status uh, becomes great. And at that time, you then are within the system and you are getting your excitement or your social excitement and your social needs taken care of. As a young child or as a young person growing up, you are basically expected to carry on the drudgery or the work that is uh, the older people don't want to do. And accordingly, the structure is set up so that the young people do, uh, as part of their service, as part of their paying their dues, do do this work. 
the preparation of food, work on the plantation, these are the domestic chores demanded. For the young, it would seem a somewhat dull and arduous life without much outlet for youthful ambitions. For those in westernized schools who feel they are within reach of another world, the traditional obligations can seem even more constricting. One by one. Elaine Allo has to deal with all the pressures of both worlds. Keep your name. Elaine dreams of a lifestyle that doesn't fit in with the Fa'a Samoa, the customs of traditional Samoa. No, these are all we have on stock. Go clean plantation, go do this, go do that. You know, we want to go out and do what normal teenagers do. Go cruise. I don't mind doing things for our family, but and there's a line, though, that they have to stop and think about us, you know. There's time we want to go out, at, you know, with the girls and go watch the movies and stuff. But they said that girls don't go and do that. You know, the girls' job is to stay home, clean the house, and that's a bunch of bull. Cause, I mean, I don't mind, but they keep pushing it. Pretty soon they're going to go over, and I'm kind of getting sick of it. But even Elaine, like many educated Samoans, has a deep respect for the Fa'a Samoa. She may fight against demands to perform domestic chores and to work on the plantations, but she has trained very seriously to take on the role of Taupo at her family kava ceremony. <laughs> This is the first time she has taken part. By traditional standards, her performance is not very polished, but she performs it with good grace. Yeah. Elaine accepts the system. She admires it and wants to be part of it. She hasn't yet revolted against its disciplines, but some have, including her boyfriend. Division of the High Court of Samoa Succession, members of the bench, Justice Gardner, Judges Tawanu'u, and all of you. Your Honor, we have a plea agreement to submit to the court for consideration. Here, the American judicial system applies. The defense and prosecuting attorneys can reach an agreement which they jointly put to the judges. A violent crime for a small reward. A familiar story everywhere in the world, but again, unexpected in paradise. Alleges that the uh, three defendants went into a house in the Utale Beach area. Two of the defendants, uh, John Ma'i and Nick Tuala, uh, went into the house initially with the third defendant staying outside as a watch person. That once they got inside, Mr. Lyle Richmond, who lived there, discovered them. John Ma'i had a 22 caliber handgun. The handgun was turned upon the victim. He was beaten by Nick Tuala. Uh, he was then robbed of approximately $35 from his person. And uh, then the third defendant came inside and they took some a radio tape repair and some, some liquor, I think. Those are roughly the facts as you understand them, uh, Mr. Yerrick? Yes, Your Honor. All right, I'd like to discuss it with my associate judges to determine whether, in their opinion, this is an adequate disposition of the matter. We'll take a short recess for that purpose. Right. 
It will be the judgment of the court, as far as John Mahi is concerned, that uh, for the offense of robbery in the first degree as set forth in count one of the information, that he be confined to prison for a period of 15 years. As to Willie Kiliona, it would be the judgment of the court that he be confined to prison for a period of 10 years. And as to Nick Tuala, that he be confined to prison for a period of 10 years. Each of you will be ordered taken to the Tafuna Correctional Institution to serve your term. You will, have, of course, have credit for time served. Thank you, gentlemen. Court will now be adjourned. Seventeen and sixteen, and they lock us up like adults. You know what I mean? That's not how the state's law is. And you know, we're just seventeen. As you can see, the handcuffs—they treat us like animals at them, them tafuna. It is too easy to argue that violent crimes result from contact with the outside world. It is an insult much resented by Samoans, to see them as simple, gentle people without the full range of passions and frustrations. John Mahi and his friends seem to have acted violently for the most trivial of rewards. What makes three high school students from good families commit a mindless act of violence? It was, see, it was for our, really it was for our, our, our friend's birthday and we promised that we would get him, we'd get him some beer, but we didn't have no money. So we went, we went downtown for some money. We had no other way, so we went to that house. See, I went in first with the gun, the 22 Special, and me, and then he came right in the back of me. And then just me and him, and he was outside as a lookout. And then we didn't really beat him up bad. See, he just hit him and hit him three times, and he knocked out. Traditionally, the stability of the Samoan system rests on the authority of the Matai, not on the self-discipline of the individual. But today, it is that authority which is most resented. See, if you, you know, these are what, like, uh, Makais, you know, the Aumangas, that's our police of the village. You know, if they catch you doing something wrong, they beat you, they, be, they beat you up. And if you turn around and beat them up, you know, they'll get the whole Aumanga, you know, it's like the whole village come in the front of your house and beat you up in the front of there. They can kill you without even going to jail. That's how the Samoan custom is. You mean you couldn't go to the police for protection? No. The police will be on their side too. They'll be on their side too, because it's more in custom. They like helping the Matai, the big uh, older man. They don't, they don't help little kids like us. Yelfana <laughs> I've seen kids beaten in such a way that they're beaten until they stop crying. These are kids four or five years old. That his parents will take and hit a kid and say, Uma, 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 which means enough, finished. And you, take, you watch these kids who are absolutely furious, they're enraged, and they'll go... <laughs> and you see them go stiff. They stiffen as they learn to hold it in and control it.
Christianity came to Samoa in the early 19th century, and it took root. In every village, authority is shared between the church and the Matai. The combination is a powerful one. The young are surrounded on all sides by a benevolent but all-embracing network of authority. empty churches. On Sunday the bells toll, the streets are empty, Samoa is at prayer in its various denominations. Tight-knit communities bound by family ties and religious prescription. Every night, there is a curfew at dusk. The Amanga, the young men of the village, stop all traffic, all movement. We're waiting here a few minutes, huh? okay? Yeah, thank you. Then evening prayers begin in every village and in every household, and every member of the family attends. Victorian scene in the South Seas. Family prayers. Praying together may keep a family together. It also serves to reinforce the authority of the head of the house. The weight of the authority of the chief can weigh very heavily on the backs of a lot of these young people who may be impatient for that day when it may come, when they may get power. They are promised eventual power if they buy into the system, if they obey. Um, there's a saying in Samoa, in fact, it's something like a, a national motto almost, which is oleale le pule ole tautua, which means the path to power is through service. You, you lower yourself, subordinate yourself, and eventually you'll be rewarded with power. But sometimes that requires a tremendous capacity to put up with frustration that requires a tremendous ability to put up, to tolerate a tremendous amount of authority over one in order eventually someday maybe to get your turn. Apia is the only town in Western Samoa. It is a port and a market and the one place that the young can go to escape the all-embracing authority of the village. One of those who has left his home in the village and moved to the town to seek a very different lifestyle is a young man nicknamed Isumu, the rat. Well, the normal thing to me is get up in the morning and go down to town, eh? go to some pictures, you know, like cinemas, billiard saloon, you know, meet friends, and working friends. If there's no movie on today, and I, I don't think I'll be down at the movie, but if there's a movie, it's seven days a week. And I, I sure tell you that I'll be in the theater all day, <laughs> seeing them all the movies.
For the young, traditional life offers few outlets for their natural impulses, little scope for individual freedom. Some escape authority by suicide. Some who can't wait for the adrenaline of power turn to crime. Others, like Isumu, play a waiting game. I am planning maybe in five or six years' time. And then I, when it's my turn to become a Matai, and then I'll move back to the village and uh, have my share of saying, saying to the family, you know, I'm going to like giving orders out to the family and tell them what to do. Yes. What he wants, it seems to me, is he wants his cake, he wants to eat it. He wants the power without the service. And that is a temptation. He doesn't want to stay in that village and, and do the dirty work. And there's always a tension in Samoan society between, you know, is it the young kid who's sort of quietly served the chief who's going to be handed the title, or is it the guy who's very gifted, very articulate, very learned, perhaps even rich, who can come in and somehow grab the title and get the power. He's trying to have his cake and eat it, I think. The prodigal son, who tries to escape from the village, is a regular target for satirical sketches, which are the highlight of the fear fears, the boisterous musical parties that take place in the villages. His way of life is seen as a kind of rake's progress. He gambles, goes dancing, and takes girls for rides in his car. All the rake wants is a car, a girl to love him, a beer to drink, and to go to the movies. But the audience know well that the village life is the better one, and that eventually he'll come home. <laughs> Ma sao chi ta? 
It has been too easy to impose an image of paradise on lovely Samoa, our image, not theirs. We have sought a model from which to measure our own fall from grace. A world without conflicts, a world without restrictions, a world also without responsibilities. Samoa has its share of both goodness and evil. Samoans, like the rest of us, have ideals, and, like the rest of us, they don't always live up to them. I think this, this kind of explanation makes a heck of a lot of sense of the apparent contradictions about Samoan sexuality. Is sexuality casual in Samoa, or do Samoans have this cult of virginity? Well, the answer is in some way, possibly both. That is, there's a time and a place for everything. And it seems to me that, 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 that while there are, I'm sure, women who marry as virgins in Samoa, not everybody does, but it's very important that at least at the top level, the high-born people maintain at least the appearance of virginity, perhaps even virginity, because they represent the ideal. They must realize the ideal. If other people fall, well, that's human nature, isn't it? We can't all somehow conform to the highest expectation. And one of the things that I, I found that I love about Samoa is that finally, in the end, they're very human people. They have a wonderful sense of human failing. And so long as they can stick to their ideals and articulate their ideals and visualize and dance out their ideals, it frees them sometimes to be quite a bit looser than that as they actually live out their lives. I don't lie. 